Okay, if we could turn, please, to Revelation 11. We're going to read the first 13 uh, verses. Revelation 11, verses 1 through 13. We're going to be looking particularly at the two witnesses this morning. And so beginning in verse 1, it says, There was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God in the altar in them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the god of the earth and if any man will hurt them fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies and if any man will hurt them he must in this manner be killed these have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. In the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake was slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us uh, this morning. We, we've been thinking about this chapter that really, as we've said, is is uh, kind of a, uh, a, a section that is looking at the places, a parenthetical section that's looking at the places. And we looked in chapter 10 at planet Earth, the scene of all of this activity claimed for God by this angel sent down from heaven, claimed for the Lord Jesus. And now in chapter 11, we're looking at Jerusalem and uh, the, the holy city. And we saw that in Jerusalem, the holy city, uh, there will be a temple built. It's to be measured. And part of that temple, the temple of God, the altar, and them that worship therein, is being marked out as there's something for God still in this city. And, and of course, the altar uh, is, as we think observed last time, is the incense altar, because that is in the temple. The other altar, uh, the brazen altar, is in the courtyard. And so the courtyard, verse 2, the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. So, so what this is telling us is that even there's even something for God, even in these dark days. And it is interesting that temple worship uh, will be reestablished. And God will own what is being offered, at least on that incense altar, uh, and accept it. It's for him. Uh, and so, again, we can see we're definitely in a different dispensation. In fact, we're going to see that throughout this chapter, that there's there's nothing of the church age in this chapter. Uh, again, we, we insist the church is raptured 
prior to the tribulation period, and the evidence is overwhelming for anybody that wants to see it, uh, because we're definitely not on uh, what we say the grounds of grace at this time. And so certainly this temple, the altar, those that worship therein, uh, again, this has been measured off and marked off for God. But then the rest of it is handed over to the Gentiles for 40 and two months. And again, so uh, we're going to see actually that uh, this outer court, one of the things that's going to be set up there, and uh, we'll see that when we get to chapter 13, is an image of the beast is going to be. So idolatry will be in the outer court, but it's handed over to the Gentiles 40 and two months. And so we just want to uh, observe that. And so then in verse three, uh, as we think about this city, there is something for God. Most of it's handed over to the Gentiles uh, to, for that uh, three and a half year period. But also, at least in the first half of the tribulation, and we'll explain why we believe this, God is not going to leave himself without a witness in this city. And he is going to have two witnesses. And we want to look at these two uh, witnesses, particularly today, um, and we want to look at them in three different ways. <laughs> uh, so first of all, I want to look at them as a role model for ministry today. There are things that we can learn from their example. We don't often think of it that way, but we want to think about at least some things that stand out about these men's ministry that we can learn from today. Secondly, uh, we want to look at these men in terms of how they somehow Christologically picture the ministry of the Lord Jesus. They ministered for three and a half years. He did too. Uh, they're publicly uh, uh, put to death. Uh, he was too. They they rise from the dead. He did. So we're going to look at that. We'll, we'll get into details, but I want you just to see that they actually are an amazing picture uh, or parallel to the ministry of the Lord Jesus in many ways. And then the third aspect, which is the way we're expecting, we're going to look at them in terms of their prophetic significance. So first of all, I want to just think of them in terms of role models for ministry today. And I want you to notice that they operate in God-given power. Now, verse 3, it says, I will give power unto my two witnesses. And you'll notice if you've got a King James Bible, the word power is in italics, which means it's not there in the original. But you can understand why the King James translators have put the word there, because the very next verse says, these are the two olive trees and two lampstands standing before the God of all the earth. And that immediately takes us back to the book of Zechariah. We'll look at those verses in chapter four in a little while, but these were sons of oil, uh, just like Zerubbabel and Joshua, the high priest. And how did they minister? How did they do their work? Well, the Lord says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And so what we could say is that these, these men that God has raised up to be a testimony in these dark days, they are men who operate in divine power. And certainly, uh, we're living in dark days. How should we be serving the Lord? How should we be operating? Well, that same divine power, right? You shall be witnesses unto me. How? Well, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so what we would say is that as a role model for ministry, what we can learn from these men is because of the difficulty of the day, we dare not operate in our own strength. We need divine power for service. And the Spirit of God is provided for that purpose. And we certainly want to acknowledge that. Notice too, just again, practical lessons from them. Notice it talks about them. In verse 3, at the end, it says uh, that they were clothed in sackcloth. And what that would tell us is um, there's a soberness and a seriousness about these men. <laughs> they saw the conditions of their day. And they weren't days for joking and cutting up and having a... They were, they were very sober days. And so, uh, again, we might ask ourselves, are we like that? Uh, do we regard sin lightly? <laughs> we should never do that. Uh, we're in days where there's such rebellion and th there should be a, a, a solemnity and a soberness about ministry. And uh, I was just really enjoying, I spent quite a bit of time in my devotions this week, just enjoying Acts 26 
And I just want to read one verse uh, about Paul's ministry. And I just thought it was very interesting and one that should mark our ministry. In, in Acts 26, verse 25, it says, he said, he, he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. <laughs> and certainly what we could say is these were men in Revelation 11, there's a solemnity, there's a sobriety about their ministry for God. And we can learn from that. We can learn the importance of that. And we certainly need to be solemn and serious. These are very uh, distressing days. And uh, as we preach, there needs to be in that earnestness, that soberness, that seriousness, that solemnity uh, that marks our ministry. And that, sadly, I feel like it's almost like it's cool to be a comedian. And I'm not saying we, we, we shouldn't have a sense of humor, but, but when we're talking about things like heaven and hell and eternity, uh, it's not the time for, for trying to be a comedian. It's the time to be serious. These are very serious things. And the third thing I just want to say quickly about these men is that they were able to work together. And, and I say that because it's not always easy for men to work together for the, for, for the purposes of God. And if you, if you wonder where I'm going with that, just ask Paul and Barnabas. I'm going through the book of Acts right now, and my next message is going to be the end of Acts 15. And uh, what's going on there? Well, Paul and Barnabas have a big fallout. Uh, great men, men who we have come to appreciate if you've gone through the book of Acts. And yet uh, getting on together is very challenging, and especially when days are stressful and difficult. And these two witnesses, witnesses they ministered together for that three and a half year period they labor together and they're a role model to all of us can i can i get on with my brethren can i work with my brethren uh, am i am i somebody who's easy to work with or am i a difficult individual to work with and uh it's just a challenge and so i just throw those things out and then we said tip typologically as they picture in some way the ministry of christ i'm just going to go through this ministered for three and a half years they did mighty miracles just like the lord jesus did they <clears throat> were killed and in the process publicly mocked and ridiculed just like the lord jesus and then they rise again and they ascend to heaven, just like the Lord Jesus. So in a sense, they reflect their master very much in their ministry. But what we're all, I'm sure, particularly interested in is them prophetically seeing their tribulation ministry. And so it tells us that they, they're they given by God. Uh, it says in verse 3, I'll give power to my two witnesses, uh, and so they're, they're men that were given by God for the hour, uh, and they shall prophesy uh, 1,203 score days clothed in sackcloth, 1,260 days or three and a half years based on the Jewish reckoning of a 360-day year in the Jewish calendar. And so, again, three and a half year period. We're going to suggest to you it's the first half. We're going to prove that i hope as we go on uh that that they minister in the first half of the tribulation period uh, we observed already they were wearing sackcloth and that is the traditional garb of mourning uh, and if you look back to the book of daniel a lovely chapter that also has great prophetic significance daniel chapter 9 but in daniel chapter 9 we'll find in uh, daniel as he is um setting himself to seek the Lord. Uh, verse three, it says, and I set my face unto the Lord God. This is Daniel nine, verse three. I set my face unto, unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And again, he's mourning. God's people are in captivity. <laughs> it's not a good situation. And so he sets himself to prayer and fasting and mourning. And also just another couple of references, the book of Jeremiah, uh, just Jeremiah chapter four, again, where we see this connection uh, 
with solemn and sorrowful conditions with sackcloth and ashes. So Jeremiah 4 and verse 8, he says, For this gird you with sackcloth, lament and howl, for the fierce anger of the Lord is hot, sorry, is not turned back from us. And of course, this is to do with the impending Babylonian judgment and captivity. And he urges the people to get into sackcloth, a picture of mourning for the sad conditions. And then just one other reference in the book of Joel, again, all prophetically significant books, uh, minor prophets, <clears throat> book of Joel, chapter one and verse 13. He says, put ye Sorry, chapter 1, verse 13. And rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the... That's chapter 2. Sorry, chapter 1, verse 13. Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests. Howl, you ministers of the altar. Come, uh, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meal offering and the drink offering is withholden of the house of your God. So... <clears throat> the traditional garb of mourning and showing a solemn and sorrowful over the depths of which Jerusalem has sunk. And remember, at this time, first three and a half years, they've made a deal with the man who is, is ultimately the man of sin. <laughs> yeah, they've made a deal with him. They've made a covenant with death. And so these are solemn conditions. And so God has raised up these men to speak to the nation about their compromised state and where they are. They're so enamored uh, with this slick speaking political leader. And so they're wearing sackcloth as they minister. And of course there's two of them and that's significant too, isn't it? Because two is the minimum of legal testimony. Uh, we, we see that frequently uh, when God sends out witnesses, usually he sends them out two by two, doesn't he? Uh, we see that in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, when he sent his disciples out, he sent them two by two. Uh, Matthew 18, verse 20, the minimum of testimony, right? Where two or three gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. So again, it's the bare minimum. And of course, all this comes from the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, and uh, again, the minimum of legal testimony too. Uh, Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. Let me just read it to you. Deuteronomy 19, verse 15 where we, we read simply this statement, one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, in any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. So God is speaking to a nation who is compromised and in sin. It's the holy city, but spiritually it's Sodom and Egypt right now. And so uh, God has raised up two witnesses to confront them about their sin. And of course, the big question that's on everybody's mind is who are these two witnesses? And there are different views that are given. Some believe it's Moses and Elijah. Others suggest Enoch and Elijah. Now, the reason, of course, Enoch and Elijah are uh, suggested is because um, both men went to heaven without dying. And so the question is, well, why did they do that? And what purpose was in view? And many believe that it was to come back for this very hour. Now, one of the weaknesses of that coupling Enoch and Elijah is that Enoch never witnessed to Israel and this is a, a, a witness to Israel right they're they're in the city uh, which spiritually is Sodom and Egypt they're witnessing to the nation of Israel about their apostate state in making this covenant with the man of sin and so Although Enoch did prophesy about the Lord's coming, we know that from Jude 14 and 15, and he prophesied before judgment was imminent. But a weakness is he didn't minister to Israel. On the other hand, Moses and Elijah have a definite witness to Israel. And not only do they have a witness to Israel, but they represent the law and the prophets. 
right? Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets. And so a twofold witness from God against apostate Israel, one coming with all the force of the law, the other coming with the prophetic ministry, speaking of their failure. And as we observe the things that they did, we certainly, it's not a stretch to see Moses and Elijah in their ministry. Uh, for instance, as we notice, uh, for instance, in verse 5, if any man hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth. Well, certainly Elijah was the prophet of fire, and he was good at calling down fire from heaven and <clears throat> devours their enemies. Uh, verse 6, they have power to shut heaven. Well, remember uh, that it rained not. Well, e Elijah did that for three and a half years, didn't he? During the wicked days of Ahab. And guess what? They're going to do it again. Uh, I believe, uh, again, just showing Elijah-like ministry. And have power over waters to turn them to blood again in verse 6. That has written all over it the ministry of Moses. So it would, it would seem both by their type of ministry, uh, the miracles that they're able to do, it has Moses and Elijah written all over them. Also, if you remember, these two appeared together on the Mount of Transfiguration in Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, where they spoke to the Lord Jesus concerning his exodus from the world. And we just read that. But um, so we've seen them uh, before. Uh, chapter 19, verse 30, saying, Go ye. Verse 30. No, that's it's not um, 19. Let's look at Matthew 19. Maybe that's where I'm wanting to be. I thought I'd gone through and checked all these references beforehand, but obviously not that one. Nope, not Matthew 19 either. Anyway, we do know uh, without <laughs> having the scripture to hand here that they both appeared um, on the Mount of Transfiguration. Let me just, let me try one more. Luke 9, I bet that's where it is. <laughs> Luke 9, verse 30 and 31. There we go. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Luke 9, 30 and 31. And also, we, we do know that the Lord said that Elijah would appear before the coming of Messiah. Uh, we know that from the prophecy of Malachi. Last book of the Old Testament, this that Elijah should come before the coming of the Lord. It says um, in Malachi 4, 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He'll turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So, we might uh, suggest then that the evidence seems to strongly support that these were Moses and Elijah, two men who will minister to Israel, representing the law and the prophets, doing miracles in uh, the, 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 the day, the dark days of the tribulation period. Now, at the very least, what we could say is, that if it's not literally Moses and Elijah, I tend to think it will be. 
but we would have to say that they certainly in Luke 1 17 it talks about John the Baptist that he ministered in the power and spirit of Elijah and certainly at the very least these two individuals will minister in that way and uh, and yet in my mind I, I do believe that God would raise up Moses and Elijah in the last days and of course one of the difficulties with that is that uh, Moses died and was buried uh, but we've already seen that he was clearly resuscitated when he appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. <laughs> and so uh, just like uh, you have men like Lazarus, for instance, who were, were risen and yet then died a second time because it wasn't their ultimate resurrection body. And so uh, is there any wonder, perhaps, that Satan disputed with Michael the archangel over the body of Moses? Is it because God intended to use this body, resuscitating him, bringing him back to life again, to not only appear on the Mount of Transfiguration, but to appear in Jerusalem in the last days as a witness and a testimony? So back again in chapter 11, verse 4, we said that the, these are two olive trees and two lampstands. And again, that takes us back to the minor prophets and Zechariah. Uh, we've already studied this many moons ago and, and as we considered Zechariah together. But it says in verse 11, then answered I and said unto him, what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the lampstand and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, what be these two olive branches, which through the golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he, he said, do you not know what these be? I said, no, my Lord. And he said, these are the two anointed ones. Darby translates that the two sons of oil, because the idea of anointed, chrisma in the Greek is, is anointing with oil. These are the two sons of oil which stand before the Lord of the whole earth. And so the picture back in Zechariah was that for a difficult time like that, God raised up two men, uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest, to give direction to the, lead to the nation, leadership to the nation. They operated in the power of the Spirit concerning the rebuilding of the temple in very difficult times. Here in Revelation 11, we're once again in difficult times. The temple is rebuilt, but there's spiritual departure in the nation. Uh, they've entered in, the vast majority have entered into a covenant of death with the man of sin. And so these men, like uh, these Old Testament men, Joshua and Zerubbabel, are raised up in the power of God's spirit, not by might, nor by power, but by spirit, saith the Lord. And they're going to give powerful witness through the Holy Spirit to apostate Israel in these dark times. Notice, too, it says uh, that they have a divine protection here. If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouths now again let me just say this that it, it seems to me that we're in a very different dispensation to the current one because if you remember and i hope i've got this reference right in luke's gospel chapter 9 you have an incident where the sons of thunder chapter 9 verse 51 Let's just break in Luke 9, 51. It came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans and make ready for him to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this they said lord wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as elias did but he turned and rebuked them and said you know not what manner of spirit you are of for the son of man is not come to destroy men's lives but to save them 
and they went to another village. So what we see is that as the Lord is introducing that new age, the gospel age, and, and what he's, there's a, def, there's a definite different spirit here, not call, he's come to save men's lives, not to destroy them. And yet here, Moses and Elijah, it says, they are given power, out, uh, fire proceeds out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. If any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. And again, you can't spiritualize this. I mean, it's interesting. I was I was uh, reading some of the amillennial commentaries, and they talk about uh, this is the the gospel testimony, um, and this is you know the fire of the Holy Spirit speaking. But it, it, again, it's it's so specific here. Fire comes out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. <laughs> this is administering death to their enemies through fire proceeding out of their mouths. And so again, how different. Uh, what does it say in our dispensation? Second Timothy 2, 24, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men. <laughs> so clearly there's a difference here, isn't there? And, and again, it would tell us very clearly, we have a temple built, <laughs> uh, we have God accepting the, the sacrifices, uh, we have people ministering, uh, doing miracles, uh, Mo Moses and Elijah like, and even basically burning their enemies to a crisp. And so clearly, and, and there's no rebuke given here. Again, we, we want to emphasize this. The church age is over. The age of grace has ended. When we're here in Revelation in the first half of the tribulation period. And this is the great and terrible day of the Lord. God directly interferes in the, in the affairs of men. And this is not the age of grace. And I think it's so obvious uh, that, but, but we need to spell it out because there are many who are deluded in their understanding that uh, this is this is the church age and they spiritualize all this stuff and it's to me it's just nonsense, and so uh, they have power, uh, verse six, to shut heaven, and just like um, Elijah for three and a half years, so it doesn't rain. They have power to turn water into blood. Again, that was the miracles of Moses and Elijah, uh, very clearly laid out. And they have power to bring plagues as often as they will. And so, again, we, we, we just want to think about this. Interesting that the first miracle Moses did in Egypt was turning water into blood. The first that we find that in Exodus chapter 7. And what a contrast to the Lord Jesus and his first miracle that he did. He turned water into wine. <laughs> yeah. Joy and blessing comes, right? Law came by Moses, but grace and truth comes by Jesus Christ. And it's just good to see these contrasts. But nevertheless, these men, they're bringing plagues again because Israel is so apostate. They've made this covenant signed this covenant and so uh, they once again are going to be idolatrous idolatrous subject to gentile power just as these men ministered in a time of departure uh, moses and elijah uh, in a, a time when israel were under a severe gentile power and so we have these very similar pictures here verse seven it says and when they have finished their testimony Again, it's interesting that God's servants are immortal until their work on earth is done. <laughs> they're not allowed to, they, they can defend themselves by they're against their enemies until they have finished their testimony. And not a moment before they have finished their testimony. It says, the, when they had finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So this is why I'm suggesting to you that their ministry is in the first half of the tribulation period. 
because this beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, when does that happen? I want to suggest to you that when we look at Revelation 13, this, this leader, this, this man of sin, this, uh, this political leader that's going to come to power by making this peace deal with Israel, we, we read in verse 3 of Revelation 13, I saw one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death. Now, we, we want to save all the details that, as it were, is significant. But we want to save that till we get to chapter 13. We saw one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And I want to suggest to you that what happens is that this world leader, there is an attempted assassination that appears to be successful. And so one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death. And I do believe that at that point, uh, the one that ascends out of the bottomless pit, as it were, indwells this body and becomes what we know as this beast that will demand worship and also worship directed to Satan. And so this beast that comes out of the bottomless pit, I do believe, will take place at the midpoint of the tribulation period, just, just when uh, that's when things are going to turn sour for Israel. And so one of the first things that he does in his new, as it were, pseudo resurrected position, because again, he's pretending to be like the true Messiah who indeed died and rose again. He's going to kind of, as it were, simulate that. And so it says when they have finished their course, for three and a half years, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And so it almost seems like a bad thing has happened. But God has a greater way of demonstrating his power at this particular moment. And it reminds me a little bit of John 11. Uh, why don't you just go back there just for a second, John 11 and verse 4, the story of Lazarus. And, of course, Lazarus falling asleep. And it tells us in verse 4 of John 11, when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And so the whole experience of Lazarus and the fact that he actually did fall asleep and had been dead four days, what was the point of it all? It was for the glory of God that the Son of God should be glorified. And so even allowing these servants, servants of his, to be killed by the beast is actually paving way for a more glorious act that demonstrates his power over life and death. And so it tells us in verse 8, Their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So Israel and Jerusalem called Sodom, which is quite a statement, and Egypt. And again, why? What's going on here? Well, uh, Sodom would indicate that there's great immorality in the nation. And, of course, Egypt would talk about it being under the power of a, uh, of a cruel ruler, which it was because they'd signed this covenant. And so this is the state of Israel. Now, again, it's not the first time that God has uh, used Sodom, at least, to describe the nation. And in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, uh, the nation had been described in those terms. Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah's marvelous prophecy, and he speaks again to an apostate nation as he's speaking. And he says in verse 9, he says, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. 
Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. And so Jerusalem, with all its rebuilt temple, is far from what it ought to be. And of course, it was guilty of the most heinous crime of all. It says, where also our Lord was crucified. What a terrible thing was done in that city. That city that should be the holy city, that should be set apart for God, they actually were guilty of crucifying our Lord there in Jerusalem. And so it says in verse 9, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall, shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. They won't even allow these prophets to be given the, the afforded the dignity of a decent funeral and burial. They just allow their bodies to lie there. It's kind of like a triumphal, look at the power of the beast. Who is able to make war with the beast? Look at what he's done with these so-called prophets. There they are for all to see. And so uh, that, again, that's Revelation 13. Who, uh, after his uh, pseudo resurrection, the question is, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And so uh, what, what a description of the hardness of the human heart. God's prophets. And what is the world doing? Men whose ministry was so owned of God. It says uh, that um, they, they won't give them the dignity of a burial. And it says, they that dwell on the earth shall rejoice over them, make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth and so it'll be like a satanic christmas <laughs> they'll all be buying presents one for another at the death of these two witnesses and again you can just imagine it's not hard for us to see all the world watching right that's not a difficulty today is it everybody yeah i, I just was driving down the road the other day and i saw somebody sat on the ground uh, obviously looked a rough character but they're just staring into their phone <laughs> again this is the world we're in it's it's so and so it's not hard to see how all the world uh, will watch them it it, it says um, they of the people verse nine kindreds and tongues and nations all over the planet shall see their dead bodies three days and a half shall not suffer their bodies to be in the graves and so there's great rejoicing over their death. Presents sent, gifts sent one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. And isn't it a sad thing in a sense? But they had a message from God and it was considered to be torment <laughs> to, to the earth dwellers. Because you see, it, it is torment to them because they think this world belongs to them. And the two witnesses are telling them, no, this is, this is Christ's world. He is coming to rule and reign. And it's torment to them to hear this. They don't want to hear this. They don't, they don't want to hear uh, any clear arguments. And, and we find today, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Um, people are not interested in arguments. They're, they just like shouting and, and they won't listen. And, and, and so th these people, they're, they're not really interested in, in hearing their message. Uh, it torments them truth torments them <laughs> uh, and also of course uh, then they, they were tormented because of the plagues that what these men brought as judgment upon them and so verse 11 it says after three days and a half the spirit of life from god entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them God is so good at spoiling the party. Do you remember when uh, in Daniel chapter 5, Belshazzar's feast, and there they are, they're all supping out of the, 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 the temple uh, wine goblets and all the rest of it, and they're just having a great party. And all of a sudden, 
the writing on the wall and the party is spoiled and there here's the very king himself he's his bones are shaking when he sees this event well this is another one of those bone shaking miracles the world will watch and see the mightiest miracle since the resurrection of christ from the dead this is some amazing miracle and the two prophets literally the spirit of life from god enters into them they stand on their feet and as a result it says great fear and and the language here is this exceeding terror astonishment once again men's hearts will fail them for fear and so they witness the resurrection not pseudo resurrection these people come back to life the spirit of life from god and again again this is a a, a final warning to the world of the supreme power of god over life and death he is the one that gives life uh, he is the one that uh, points death and he is the one that can give victory over death and so what a message that is going out here now notice verse um verse 11 sorry verse 12 uh, they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them come up hither now we already saw that already in chapter 4 verse 1 when god said to john come up hither <laughs> and now we see he's saying to these two witnesses come up hither and they ascend to heaven in the sight of their enemies and what an amazing climax to these events <laughs> it says they heard a great voice from heaven saying come up unto them come up hither and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them and again you can imagine people absolutely staring at this event watching eyes fixed as these individuals that they'd seen dead for three and a half days suddenly rise from the dead and ascend into heaven and verse 13 it says the same hour was there a great earthquake and again we believe that there will be a great earthquake at the midpoint of the tribulation period and it tells us the tenth part of the city fell and in the earthquake was slain of men now again there's just a little kind of technical point here but but in the marginal reading it says were slain of the names of men 7000 and the thought is this that it implies specific men men whose names were known and singled out and selected 7000 of the names of men are going to perish in that earthquake as a tenth part of the city falls now who are these seven thousand well we don't know but could be that they're maybe the beast's special bodyguard maybe they're a special unit of special forces connected with the beast we, we don't know but these seven thousand are set apart for death in this earthquake by god vindicating god's prophets and i couldn't help but think seven thousand where else do we see that again back in the days of elijah when he thought he was the only one <laughs> do you remember there were seven thousand who had not bowed the knee to baal here are seven thousand who had bowed the knee <laughs> to this end time ruler the beast and these uh, associates of the beast they perish in this earthquake and so it says the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the god of heaven now the remnant is this the true remnant that are there those that truly are worshiping that are not carried away and swept away with the beast they give glory to the god of heaven and so there god always has a remnant doesn't he even in that that those dark days two-thirds of the jews will die a third of them will survive and how many of those um, are already uh, have been listening to the ministry of the two witnesses so that leads us to verse 14 where we're going to get pick up the action again the second woe is past and behold the third woe comes quickly it's getting us back 
on the chronological flow again. Uh, so we've had this like kind of little uh, parenthetical look at the places. And now we're back on schedule. Uh, the second woe is passed. And behold, the third woe comes quickly. And remember, these are the trumpet judgments. The first four were just trumpets. The th last three were, were woes. And so verse 15, we, we have the seventh angel sounded. And there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So it's announcing the, the imminent coming and rule of Christ. See, remember this, this the, the, the seventh angel sounding opens up the seven last judgments that come very quickly and then at the end of that christ comes so now we uh, we've already saw in the previous chapter that in the voice of the seventh angel verse seven of chapter 10 when he shall begin to sound the mystery of god should be finished and he hath declared his servants the prophets uh, and so the mystery of god is about to be finished which is christ uh, christ coming to reign and so we have the rule of Christ announced. We have the rejoicing of the elders at the prospect of this coming rule of Christ. Verse 16 and 17, the four and 20 elders which sat before God on their seats fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. And so again, it's anticipating the fact that he is coming to reign. He's coming to take up his rightful place. And so rejoicing of the elders. And then verse 18, retribution and reward. It says the nations were angry. Literally, the nations were wrath and thy wrath is come. And the time of the dead that they should be judged and that they should Give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them that destroy the earth. So the nations were wrath, and thy wrath is come. Now, what is that about? The nations were wrath, thy wrath is come. I want us to go back to Psalm 2, because we're back in Psalm 2 all over again. He just announced that Christ is coming to reign on the earth and the earth dwellers they've already determined this earth belongs to them and so we're brought to uh, psalm 2 why do the heathen rage the people imagine a vain thing the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the lord and against his anointed saying let us break their bands asunder cast away their cards uh, their cords from us and so again there's this the nations raging there the nations are angry they're raging we, we we still don't want this man to reign over us and he says the nations were angry and thy wrath is come from this point on we're going to see a lot of emphasis on the wrath of god look at chapter 15 verse 1 I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Chapter 15, verse 7, one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Chapter 16, verse 1, I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And then 16, verse 19, it says this, and the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath and so the idea is this the nations are wrath they're mad they're they're angry they're heathen are raging but god's wrath is also about to be poured out on the earth so there's retribution his wrath is coming but also there's reward and we'll just uh, conclude with this that 
Christ's second coming to the earth is the time when the Old Testament saints will be rewarded. Notice again, verse 18, it says that the nations were angry, thy wrath is come, the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward to thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. And I just want to say this, that it's my conviction that the rapture of the church is just those who are in Christ. Technical term for the church age, those that are in him. But, and our reward will take place, our, the judgment seat of Christ will take place then. But what about the Old Testament saints? They are going to be rewarded I believe, resurrected and rewarded in conjunction with the second advent of the Lord Jesus when he comes to the earth. And our time is gone. <laughs> May the Lord encourage us with the fact that the Lord is coming.